Okay, so this is the third video lecture on the chapter of social stratification or global stratification. Uh, in the last video lecture, I we concluded with talking about um, Marx's and Weber's this theories or their definition of how they define social class. Just as a quick review, so Marx is the fellow that said there are two, basically two social classes. They are the owners and the workers. And then Weber came along and said, no, nah, it's not quite that simple. Um, that you can't, that there are relationships that are not based on ownership. Um, and he used the fellow that we kind of credit with the idea of a, of a SES for a um, social economic status with the combination of your education and your resources and how much influence you have over other people. Um, we can credit uh, Weber for all of that stuff. Okay, so in this video, I want to talk about a couple of the theories. And since we're talking about big processes, right, we're talking about uh, large societal processes, we're going to focus on the two big group theories, and that is functional theory and conflict theory. There is a symbolic interactionist perspective on social class, uh, but I'll save that for the chapters exclusively on social class instead of the focus on how the world became ranked like this. So one theory is what's called functional theory, obviously, and functional theory, as you might imagine, assumes that stratification, the social ranking, both within nations and across nation is functional that it serves a purpose. So the question is, what purpose does it serve? And the, the, the summary, I mean, the, the most simple answer is that there are, that, there, that each of the positions in the social structure have to be filled. And the assumption is, is that the jobs at the top are the hardest and require the most delayed gratification. And if you're ever gonna attract somebody to do these hard, demanding, difficult jobs, then you have to attract them to, you have to attract them with money and with social status, right? The jobs, the assumption is, is that the jobs at the bottom don't require as much skill, are not as important. And there's an emphasis right there. They're not as important. It's the important jobs. So here's the key is the important jobs are the ones that make the most, right? Those are the ones that have the highest status. And because you have to make sure that people fill those really important jobs, we pay people more. Now, this kind of makes sense, right? This is the theory that we've been taught our whole life is that the important people are at the top and have the most status and make the most money. But what the sociologists argue is who gets to decide, right? Who says or important for who and important for what? And so the critique is, um, the people at the bottom, let's think about what the people at the bottom do. Now, those may be low skill jobs, but are they really so less important that they make like 200, 300 times less, you know? So a good example would be, say, the dental hygienist versus the dentist. Yes, the dentist makes a lot of money. He went to school a lot longer, but who really does the work of the work? Right. Well, most of the time when you go to the dentist, you're spending more time with the dental hygienist, with the lower paid person. Or take, for instance, the person that cleans the building and locks the building up, as opposed to the person that owns the building. Right. The person that cleans the building is the one that has the keys to everything. They're the ones that know how to fix stuff. So who's really more important? It really boils down to how we define what is important and who gets to decide. Well, conflict theory will, will suggest to us it's the people at the top. They, they're the ones that get to decide who's more important. If it were true that the most important jobs and the hardest to do jobs and the people that were most qualified for uh, the positions are the ones that make the most money, well, then that would be what we call a meritocracy. It would be based on merit. And most of us have experienced uh, times in our life where the best person for the job, the hardest working one, the one that was most capable of doing it is not the one that got promoted, but it was some other reason. So the critics of that um, say that, this, that, it's, that we don't live in a meritocracy. And they also acknowledge, going back to the chapter on deviance, when we were talking about um, illegitimate opportunity structure is that there may in fact be an awful lot of talent down here at the bottom, but because people don't have access to 
you don't have access to being discovered, right? It's it's interesting how the talent seems to always come from up here. The people that get promoted are the ones that are already further at the top. Is there ever an opportunity for the person that cleans the building to that for their leadership skills to be discovered? Probably not, because we're not even going to consider what they have uh, to offer because they don't have access to a, what was called the uh, legitimate opportunity structure to be discovered. Um, there's another theory, and it's, this one is actually not mentioned in your textbook, and that says that one of the functions of poverty is it creates jobs. So this system actually is functional because it worked, the, the people at the bottom have, a, have uh, create jobs by being financially needy. So the lower level creates work for the middle level, and then the top level uh, is incentivizes the people from the middle. I don't. I think maybe that's discussed in the next chapter. But that theory. But so the question is: is who, as again, who does who does it benefit? Who does the structure benefit? Um, what purpose does it serve? The critique is always: who does it serve, and does it serve everyone equally? And sociologists argue no. Okay, so then you got conflict theory, right? And going back to <laughs> going back to the structure yet again, the the foundational assumption. This is Marx's theory. The foundational assumption of conflict theory is that the reason there is rank is because some people have more power than others, right? It just boils down, to, and these conflicts, these these positions are always going to be in conflict and competition for each other. The people at the top want to stay in their position of power. The people at the bottom would like to have more power. Their interests at the bottom are not the same as the people at the top, right? So basically the wealthy have power, they wanna stay there, they create the rules, so they create the rules to make sure that they stay there. And the, the middle class serves as a buffer. So I like to, I like to talk about if you've ever been, say, a shift manager, or if you've ever served as an assistant manager of a business, right? And when I have students together, most of the time, if I ask people, how did you feel about being like the middle manager? Most of them say it was very hard. And Marxist theory would argue that the reason being in the middle is so very hard is because you are both exploited, you're both, you're, there are demands placed upon you from the people at the top and you are exploiter. So you're being told by the people at the top that you have to make the people at the bottom work harder. Well, you're, so, so you're being, there's demand, they're, they're exploiting you to get you to work harder, middle manager, and then you have to turn around and dish it out and exploit the people beneath you. So which group do you belong to? Are you an owner or are you a worker? Are, you, are your interests aligned with the management, right? The management is trying to get more work out of you, but at, the so, but at the same time, you have to act like the management. And so this creates what Marxist theory calls a contradictory class location. Your you're torn. It's also the reason like in labor unions, you're not allowed to join the union because you're both, you're like, it's like kind of like you're in bed with the enemy, so to speak, right? And it can make a very, uh, it can make a very contradictory who, whose side do you sort of fall down on, right? The other theory is, is that this, and this is the whole purpose from the conflict theory model. This is the whole point of the middle manager, right, or the assistant manager or of the middle class, because the people at the bottom, they want to be like the middle class, but the people in the middle class, they want to be like the people at the top. And it's the middle managers. It's like it's the store manager is the one that separates the workers from the district manager, right? So they are, um, they create this incentive for the people at the bottom to want to be like them, but the people at the top, they never have to deal with the, mass, the masses, right? The rich never really have to deal with the people at the bottom. 
because they always have like this middle class, this middle neighborhood. So you imagine if you want to use that, uh, that concentric zone circle, again, you know, you have the very wealthy in the center, and then they have a middle class neighborhood that protects them from what all the poor people do on the outside. They never really have to see the poor people, but they can, um, yeah, because, and so one, theory about what's happening to the American middle class is that as there's a bigger gap between the people at the top and the people at the bottom is that the people, the theory goes from the conflict theorist model is the very wealthy should be getting a little uncomfortable because that's the function. You know, thinking about, um, thinking about this triangle here, right? That's exactly what's going on here. You have the peasants down here and the royalty at the top and it's the knights and the middle group that actually separate the two. What happens when the, when the middle group is gone? What happens when the middle class is gone from this model? And there's so many more people at the top and there's nobody to protect the people at the, I'm sorry, there's no many more people at the bottom. There's so many more and there's no one to protect the people at the top, right? So like, yeah, what happens then? Um, last thing I want to talk about is what Linsky argued and Linsky. So Linsky says, Hey dudes, it's not, it's not just functional. You know, you're right because in some societies, the more, the more important people do actually have more status, but you're also right that sometimes, um, the more you have, the more power you influence. And what Linsky said is that in simple agrarian societies, where there is just enough to go around, right? Where everybody has just enough. There is relatively uh, low levels of inequality, right? And the folks that are, the, the people that protect you do have more resources because it is necessary for them to have more resources. Uh, they truly are more important to the well-being of the group. But when there is extra, when there is more than enough to go around and everyone has more than enough to meet their needs, to do, to fill their function in society, that's when inequality happens because that's when people start to argue and to fight over who gets that extra loaf of bread, right? Everybody gets one loaf of bread and if you burn more calories, you get a loaf and a half, so you need it. But what happens when there's now four extra loaves of bread and everyone has what they need, then who gets to decide the extra? And that's when he says inequality starts to happen is that then it becomes about who makes the rules and who gets to decide what happens with that surplus. And so that was, um, that he says inequality is a consequence of surplus, too much extra. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there. And in the next uh, slides, we'll talk about some of the idea systems. Oh, I'm getting this really cool stuff. Okay, stop right here.